Uh, this is uh, your host, Chris White. I'm again starting off with a new format. Uh, past couple episodes uh, building on this same idea of the uh, concept of what's your evidence, because I'm really interested in having an evidence based approach to uh, looking at the world today. But at the same time, I'm very interested in art and explorations of art. And uh, so today we're trying to connect uh, both worlds, really. And uh, with our uh, guest, who's uh, Dr. William Eggington, who's a professor at Johns Hopkins University. And he's written many books and articles. The one that I'm familiar with is titled The Man Who Invented Fiction, How Cervantes Ushered in the Modern World. So welcome to the program. Chris, thank you very much for having me on the program. I'm excited to have this conversation with you. I'm so glad, you know, I've been looking for a book like this for a long time. Um, been interested in Cervantes uh, going back to uh, high school Spanish days back in the 80s even. Mm -hmm. But uh, but really, it's the kind of thing that takes uh, a lifetime to understand, wouldn't you say? Yeah, it really does. And in fact, it's, you know, we in some ways we could think about writing a book like this about uh, about Cervantes, about Don Quixote as uh, as, as making you know, making or, or, or showing what the purpose is of a humanities education, right? Um, it's, it's extremely important to be reading literature, to be reading fiction, but I think it's equally important to be doing so in an informed way, um, to be doing so in context of seminars, discussions, or maybe a kind of discussion that's outside of the classroom that, that one tries to broach precisely in books about books, in books about authors, in books about uh, literature, about literature's meaning, about what we try to do with literature, about what literature can do for uh, for us. And that's what I was trying to do with the man who invented, who invented fiction. And that's great. So let's go ahead and get straight to the beginning of the book, actually, where you talk about kind of setting a scene where people who maybe who weren't literate when they would have actually heard the story, it could have been people who were literate reading it to them in some tavern, uh, possibly. And and it seems like today the, um, you know, people who are exposed to fiction um, who aren't maybe in a Spanish program wouldn't be exposed to some, something like uh, Don Quixote. Um, would you agree? I do agree, and uh, and you know that's that's something that I find uh, lamentable in many ways. In fact, um, my my colleague and and uh, often collaborator David Castillo and I published a book recently together called "What Would Cervantes Do?" that is about using and thinking about Cervantes and other authors of the uh, of, of the Spanish 17th century in particular, because that's an area that we we tend to write a lot about or that we know a particular amount about. As, um, as, as a way or a filter or a lens to look at some of the issues that are the most pressing uh, for us today, in particular, the question of post-truth, about how communities are formed despite these, these extraordinary political gulfs that have opened up in, in societies like ours. And we're trying to make the point that, um, that reading literature and talking about literature and thinking about literature um, is as important today as it was ever, um, but not only the literature of today, but literature of other periods, uh, periods that might at first glance appear to us to be of some distance or perhaps of, of little relevance. Uh, both both of us, and as you know from reading the book, The, the Man Who Invented Fiction, I, I find that there's extreme relevance to be found in a book like Don Quixote for, uh, for today. And that's part of the point of, of writing it, is to draw attention to why more of us should be reading a book like Don Quixote today and thinking about the issues that, uh, that it raises for us. You know, I, I teach mostly modern history and uh, I mean really modern like uh, you know the past century really and I oftentimes will uh, hold one of my copies of Don Quixote and just kind of uh, ask a student to open it up to any page that they want to and just read a few lines and see if they can connect it to what's going on today yeah. and one of my favorite examples that I often go to is the example of I, I used to call it the parable of the whipping boy um, but uh, it's really, like, I guess he's a shepherd boy, right? Mm -hmm. Early on in the book, who's whipped and and uh, and I'll go through the, the story really quickly, kind of par uh, paraphrasing in some cases, but also reading directly and then get to the resolution where Don Quixote leaves and then ask the students to kind of connect it to uh, something maybe in U.S. foreign policy. And mm 
And they can, and yeah. yeah. I'm curious, what do they come up with? That's a, that's a great scene, a very interesting scene, but I, I love that exercise. And, and it'd be great to just hear an example of uh, one of your students, what they came up with. But some of them talk about Vietnam. Yeah. Some mm -hmm. talk about Iraq and Afghanistan too. Uh, it's just very easily, they can just say, oh, this is an example. You know, the United States is kind of going in with this quixotic notion of, of helping people but then we really don't understand the circumstances. And then when we leave, then mm -hmm. essentially they have to deal with it themselves. Right, the, the character that you're referring to, of course, is is, uh, is a servant of, uh, of another character. And, and Don Quixote uh, stumbles upon him at the edge of a wood and, and sees him tied up to a tree and being brutally uh, uh, beaten by his, by, his, by his master. And he, of course, sees the situation, sees it as another textbook case of, which in some ways, of course it is, of, uh, of uh, an underling being abused by, uh, by, by an overlord of, of a violation of the universal laws of justice. And he rides into the rescue and he uh, uh, intervenes and he separates the master and the, uh, and the servant. But then trusting that the master is going to live by the same code of honor that uh, that that he does he then after having done all of that very happily heads off on his way with merely a promise from the master to um to to leave the boy alone at which point of course the first thing that he does as soon as uh, the knight and his squire are out of sight is time right back up again and give him redouble his efforts at uh, at lashing him later on in the story when when they finally encounter the young man again he he basically says something along the lines of god save me from uh, knight errants and their good intentions <laughs> yeah yeah, it, yeah. It, it's just such a, a great uh, parable really because uh we can understand that don quixote he's willing to be brave right, right he's willing right. to risk his life right. and he right. wants to live up to this ideal but uh, but he has bought into a version of what's possible from these books. And, 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 and you really parse this out very well throughout the book as kind of showing how Cervantes' genius really is in laying bare all of these uh, contradictions that all of us are really susceptible to. Absolutely. And of course, what's, what's really at stake there is an analysis of how we never have a, a, a bare or a, an unfiltered relationship with some reality. Don Quixote is always riding into situations convinced that he knows exactly what they mean. He carries his interpretive framework with him. And in his particular case, the interpretive framework is all determining, right? It completely decides what a character means, what the appropriate response is, and I think that part of the message that uh, that Cervantes is is giving us here is that um, what we need to learn to do is is become better readers of those interpretive frameworks that are handed down to us, that are given to us by social structures, by social actors, by political by political actors, by discourses that instruct us on how to see the world in a way. Because if we always ride into it thinking that we're seeing the bare truth as opposed to understanding that the world is structured in certain ways for us and that the way in particular by media, right? Different sets of media, obviously, at the time that uh, Cervantes was writing than, but than at the time that we're reading. But if we tend to, in an unfiltered way, assume that we're getting the truth through our media as opposed to understanding that there are intricacies, intricacies involved, that there are intentions involved, that there are biases uh, baked into it, that's when we're at our most vulnerable. And I think that this is, that Cervantes felt this vulnerability. He suffered as a result of this vulnerability. And he was baking that wisdom into the, uh, the art of fiction that he was developing at the time. So the, the, the probably the third time that I read your book, it really started to hit home his life experiences even more. His time as a, as a soldier, his uh, travels abroad. I mean, he's, he's really all over uh, the Mediterranean world um, and uh, many different places, interacting with different people. Can you talk about how his life experiences had probably contributed to his writing later on? Oh, absolutely. And this is actually one of the things that I wanted to work out, right? One of the questions that I wanted to grapple with when I wrote The Man Who Invented Fiction. Um, many, many people 
before me had made an argument and that I largely agreed with that said, you know, something new happened with this book. They referred to it as, and often do refer to it as the first work of, of modern literature, the first modern novel. That's usually the formulation that they use. There were a couple of things that I wanted to do. One was to make a distinction between the genre of the novel and something that I felt that was deeper that Cervantes was doing in this. And that's why I called it the invention of fiction. And, and we should talk a little bit about that, but to go more specifically to your question at hand right now, the other thing that I wanted to do, the other challenge that I set for myself was to explain, okay, but why him, right? Why this particular man at this particular moment in history, there was something about the moment of history. There was something about his particular situation that gave him the tools, in addition to just the luck uh, of the genetic draw of having a particular intelligence and a particular artistic ability, and to have been thrown into a, uh, you know, a, a set of circumstances that allowed him to, in, in pretty much an autodidact kind of way, come up with the intellectual tools to be able to, to manage what he did. There was something more than that. There were a set of combined experiences that led him to the kind of insights that filtered through into this, into this creation of a new form of writing. And, and as you just referred to, that involved someone who had traveled the Mediterranean, who had seen an extraordinary array of different cultures and peoples, who had invested his passion, um, his belief into a whole, well, for lack of a better word, let's call it ideological structure, and right into a, a set of notions about what is right, what is true, that were handed down to him by the church and the crown, essentially, the, uh, the Spanish crown and the Catholic church and their alliance. And he fought and he came very close to giving his life uh, for this and for this for this combined set of values. Um, he suffered. He was um, even after almost dying uh, in the the Battle of Lepanto and 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 barely recovering uh, after a long and painful uh, uh, convalescence. He finally headed back to Spain, where he thought he was going to have a a cushy job and some sort of recognition of the services that he'd performed for his country. Um, and lo and behold, he was captured by Barbary pirates along the way, kept in captivity and squalid conditions, again, risking his life multiple times uh, and multiple attempts to escape over the next four years when he finally was ransomed almost by happenstance as, as, as it worked out, he got back to the uh, to Spain and then found he could barely survive. Uh, no one was coming and thanking him for his service. No one was, uh, was providing for him. He was having to scrape together an existence from one kind of job to another. And bit by bit racking up what we could call a series of disillusionments or disappointments where his great belief in this is the way things ought to be constantly ran into the uh, or ran afoul of uh, uh, of the you know ugly reality that this is not the way things are that your belief system is really built on a kind of house of cards a lesser man or a different kind of man probably could have just given up in bitterness uh, um, all sorts of different fruit futures we could have imagined for that man. But this one had this particular talent. And what he started doing was writing, writing plays, writing stories, and eventually writing, writing a novel in which the core character is someone who is completely bedazzled by his own belief system, which comes from these outlandish uh, uh, fairy tale style books, these books of, uh, of, of knighthood and adventure. And the, the result of which he can't see the reality right in front of his eyes. And uh, and then, of course, his mordant wit, his uh, his, his biting irony uh, lead to this particular uh, combination of, uh, of, of 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 just extraordinary tropes and characters and observations of how people are and how we all manage to fool each other that uh, that all together makes, you know, makes for this extraordinary novel. Uh, absolutely. And it occurs to me, too, that in the uh, the title of your book, Commander Who Invented Fiction, uh, it's not just that uh, he's inventing fiction, but he's also ushering in the modern world. How are the two related? The two are uh, really very related. And I, this goes back to first, I would need to clarify, you know, what does it mean in, in, in my in my definition, right, to invent fiction? Because clearly, if we just think that invention, uh, sorry, that fiction is uh, a, a kind of story um, that we tell each other that's not true and that we know is not true. And at some sort of a distance, you could consider that's a bare bones de definition of fiction that more or less works. Um, 
then obviously people have been doing this um, uh, for millennia before Cervantes and, and probably since the beginning of, 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 of oral culture in some form or another. What I am suggesting is that we moderns understand and expect fiction to be something different, to be something a little bit more complex. We expect fiction to convey characters to us and that these characters are in some ways um, both well, and that we, in order to interact with these characters, in order to consider them full-blooded, what we like to call three-dimensional characters, we, as the readers or, and I, I extend the concept of fiction to include, you know, uh, multimedia today, but it could be the fiction that occurs on the the silver screen or on the little screens that we carry around uh, in our pockets these days or uh, television series. We we expect a certain standard in the presentation of characters, that these characters are somehow both um, believable, they're like us, we can interact with them, we can feel their motivations, we can um, dislike their motivations, we can uh, distance ourselves from their decisions, but somehow we're treating them as if they were real and at the same time knowing that they're not real. Mm -hmm. And this distinction, this way of being both within and without, dividing ourselves into these two, uh, uh, these, these two readers, one reader that's perfectly aware that everything that's going on is not true, and the other that is able to turn that awareness off in order to emotionally bond with the situation at hand. This, I argue, conveyed in long form narrative prose is really, and at that level of sophistication, is really what it was new in Cervantes' work. There had been untrue stories that people knew were untrue in the past, um, stories that uh, that were ritualistic in nature, that were in, in, involved uh, um, uh, 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 religious truths, or or involved um, uh, uh, poetic figures that, that 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 people knew about and that they would go as a community and 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 revisit. But the idea of having a character in whose shoes I could walk, walking around the world, the very world that I'm walking around today. Um, but I know that person really isn't doing that. And yet I treat it for a time as if that person is. This creates a whole new set of lenses with which one can look at one's own contemporary uh, world uh, in a very critical way uh, and often in a very humorous way. And that's what Cervantes was doing. And what's modern about it is this way of dividing ourselves into um, a part of me who sits back and looks at the world um, uh, and a part of me that I sort of send inside it as my representative um, mm -hmm. to uh, an avatar, if you will, to use the language today of, 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 uh, of meeting rooms and of the, uh, of the internet, for example. This division is constitutive of a whole lot of what's going on in the era, in the in the period of time in in, in Western modernity that we call the modern era, it, it it manifests itself in our political systems and our notions of political representation. It manifests itself in our philosophy, um, uh, in the uh, idea of modern philosophy having be, been uh, started or initiated with Descartes' uh, skeptical question of uh, how is it that I can know that what's out there is real? This is a very, what I would call theatrical or in some sense, fictional question because it involves dividing oneself into two kinds of beings, one who looks and one who portrays, uh, one who's a spectator and one who's an actor on the stage of life. And all of this, this architecture of representation, of modern representation is really, it's in the very DNA of what, uh, what Cervantes created in Don Quixote. And do you think that Don Quixote is accessible to the average reader? I really do, in part because it's such a funny book, right? Yeah. And I think it's extremely helpful to have each new generation of readers have a new translation of the book, of course, as well. Uh, I'm not against the book being not only translated, but um, written into modern Spanish. There was a lot of uh, controversy in Spain when a new version came out about a decade ago, and um, and people talked about, you know, but this is, we call this, 
the language we speak in Spain and in the rest of the uh, Hispanic world. We call it La Lengua de Cervantes. We call it Cervantes's language for a reason. Why would you bastardize it? Why would you change it in that way? And I think there's, you know, there's reason to that argument. At the same time, I think that my personal opinion is that is overridden by the importance of hey, let's get this work out there. Let's make sure that people are reading this work. So a good fluid translation in a modern uh, uh, argo for today uh, in, in, in English and other languages around the world is important, but also doing something to make sure that people read it or some version of it uh, uh, in Spanish um, in the you know, enormous section of the world that is native, uh, that are now native speakers of that of that language, is is uh, is equally important. You asked, is it accessible? It is, and one of the reasons why it's so accessible, despite the fact that the language that it's written in, whether it's in Spanish or not, is you know the early translations happened within uh, within a first decade. It was such a popular book in the beginning of the 17th century. So obviously, those translations into languages that we might read or pass the book around, for example, English, they're gonna seem stodgy or old fashioned to us as well, right? So modernizing those translations, I think is a very good idea, but the story itself and the way that it's told itself is, is still extremely accessible in its own right, because it's a story about, it's a story that's extremely funny, as I mentioned before, it has action, it has slapstick comedy, uh, it has, laugh out loud guffaw uh, moments. It also is remarkably tender and it has relationships between people that are clearly based on emotional connection. It has all the things that we look for in, you know, in a good story, in a good fictional story, right? It made me laugh, it made me cry. That's the sort of thing that uh, that Cervantes is able to come up with. I agree. Yeah, there's uh, so many great little stories that uh, appear along the way that are so well thought out. And uh, it's just very surprising because he's going along in his journey. He's staying at various inns. Uh, or I can't tell if they're the same inn each time. <laughs> but there, there is one that gets returned to on several occasions, but there's others that make uh, the <laughs> showing. That's well. right. Yeah. Um, but of course, you have the most famous uh, story, the windmills. And then there's a lot of other long ones along the way. And I'm, I'm curious, do you, one story in particular, or actually, I guess eh, maybe two stand out where uh, we're dealing with women's issues. And it almost seems like he is uh, three centuries ahead of his time uh, in terms of feminism, don't you think? Absolutely. The most famous of those being the episode around Marcela and uh, um, uh, her supposed or planned or hoped for wedding. Um, uh, to someone who'd fallen in love with her, and uh, and and Marcella simply uh, refuses to go along with it. And she, um, what we see, we first encounter the stories of her great beauty, the stories of the suffering of the young uh, uh, of the young shepherd who's uh, who's committed suicide over uh, over um, her her unrequited love for uh, for him. And this is a standard. Um, kind of commonplace at the time, right? This is uh, Cervantes commenting on sort of the absurdity of what we would call the courtly love paradigm, where the the poet uh, uh, or the, the pastoral courtly love uh, uh, paradigm, where the, because all of this is a very pastoral and a kind of uh, um, uh, stereotypical way, it's this pastoral setting. Everyone is shepherds. They're all shepherds milling around and, uh, yeah. and being in love. And so the young shepherd in question is pining, and then he eventually commits suicide because of the loss of uh, or the fa the failure of Marcella to co correspond to his feelings. And everyone is, of course, condemning her, uh, and everyone is saying she is so cruel, uh, and everyone is saying she uh, she she uh, has has caused this young man's death by her by her. Uh, a uh, harsh refusal of his uh, of of his love, and Marcella comes onto the scene in the middle of the of the sort of funeral pre preparations, and she gives this impassioned speech. And in this impassioned speech, she says, "None of this is my fault. You have thrown this all on me. Not only that, it's a double standard, and it's a uh, uh, it's a double bind that I find myself in because you're saying, oh, 'Oh, I'm so beautiful that you can't help yourself,' but at the same time, you're also expecting me to be." You know, on the one hand, perfectly uh, pure and virginal, and the other hand, not let uh, all these these young men die who are claiming that they're going to die if I don't go with them. All of this is a bunch of stuff and nonsense, uh, obviously. Uh, 
at the end of which everyone's kind of standing around stunned and Don Quixote in one of his kind of great moments, moments of where you say, yeah, he's got the, the right idea here, stands up and says, everything she said is 100% true and I will challenge anyone to a duel who tries to uh, you know, <laughs> do something about it, right? And it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a great moment and you're absolutely right. You get a sense that, uh, that Cervantes is, is able and willing to sort of take our, uh, at the time, right? Um, notions of, of what one should be doing in gender roles and completely criticize them, lay them bare in their up, utmost absurdity. And what I've always find with my students is they actually find a lot of those expectations, those absurd and self-contradictory expectations that Marcella is criticizing in her beautiful speech are still implicitly lying around today. Right, that they're yeah. still underlying gender relations today, and not so. They not only find that is he three hundred years ahead of his time. In some kind of strange ways, he's still ahead of our time. Absolutely, I'm thinking of just nineteenth century literature, like uh, with, uh, well, like Uncle Tom's Cabin. You know, you don't see anything like that in there. It's still so much. It, it just seems uh, archaic by comparison to at least gender uh, issues are seem archaic, and not you know nothing against uh, Stowe, but. There, and there's another situation too. I, I, I the the first time I read this, I couldn't believe it when Sancho Panza realizes who Dulcinea is, who uh, who uh, Don Quixote is referring to, right? This um, Aldonza Lorenza or Lorenzo, right? And he talks about her as if she's almost kind of um, uh, I don't know, gender fluid or uh, or maybe at least not the depiction of uh, this uh, princess uh, that, of Dulcinea, different name, but also. He speaks about her in terms of admiring her capabilities as a person. Absolutely. Right. Right. <laughs> right. 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 Because at first it's all this talk about Dulcinea and this lady and no one even knows if Quixote has an actual person in his mind. But when pressed on the issue, he mentions that he's seen her in this uh, in this little town nearby called Toboso. And Sancho says, oh, I know who you're talking about. Right? She's basically <laughs> this milkmaid. Right. This yeah. Ill illiterate peasant girl. And then at that moment, as you're pointing out, Chris, Sancho, who's been sort of discounting anything that he's been talking about, my great lady, says, oh, well, actually, she's great. She can, you know, she can ride a mule and she can do all these great things. And because he's now interpreting the reality from his perspective, which is what's useful, right? It's useful yeah. to be able to do these things, right? To not, and with the fact that she can read or not, that's not important. What's really important is how she can, you know, she can do all these things on the farm. And when we do finally, in a, one of the great masterfully comic scenes, encounter Aldonza, she's with her uh, her friends, and <laughs> Quixote comes up, kneels before her, and starts saying this extraordinarily flower flowery speech. And this uh, you know this country girl looks at him like he's that he's he's from Mars essentially, and says, "I have no idea what these people are talking about." And then expertly vaults onto uh, onto the back of her uh, her mule and gallops away leaving them a little bit in the dust. Again, much to Sancho's uh, appreciation. Yeah, definitely. I, I, it, that's, and that's, uh, that kind of theme moves throughout. I think um, an, another one that really hit me was with uh, kind of the, um, the uh, almost the love triangle you know, that was accidental between Anselmo, Lothario, and Camilla, right, um, right. where he's testing his wife through his friend. Right, yeah. testing her um, her abilities and by actually pushing them together though, instead. Can you talk about what, what you think that was about? Yeah, I sure can. And this is another one of these moments, and I think that's why you're bringing it up right now, of, of pretty clear gender criticism, right? Criticism of gender roles and gender dynamics at the time. Um, this is uh, the most famous of what are called the intercalated tales, right? These uh, stories that are sort of fit in, in the case of the, um, the curious and pertinent, uh, which is the story that you're referring to, it's actually a manuscript that they discover in one of these inns and start reading to each other. So you have the reading of a book within the reading of a book uh, going on here. Right. And it gets interrupted at very interesting times, all of which are, you know, subject to our, uh, I think, you know, I think to really good uh, possibilities of interpretation. But the story itself is really about, again, this extraordinarily difficult and dangerous um, uh, uh, double bind, double standard that women at the time were expected to live to of absolute purity on the one hand and yet being sensual, being attractive and everything on the other. And 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 what he's really putting his finger into right now and, and kind of twisting it until it hurts is what you call the um, the the code of honor, 
at the time. And right, the honor code would be all about, uh, oh, I, my honor as a man entirely depends on the unquestionable sexual purity of my wife, my sisters, everyone in my family. And, right, yet, and yet the problem is the unquestionable sexual purity depends on what other people are talking about and what other people are, are, are uh, expecting and what they're whispering behind the scenes. So in some sense, it doesn't, the honor no longer rests even on the on the man, much less on the what a woman actually does. And there's story after story of women whose, in fact, behavior is completely unimpeachable, who end up falling to the traps of the really deadly traps of the honor uh, uh, code of the of the time, and end up, you know, being subjected to uh, honor killings. And in this particular case, you have a story just like that, where. And this is where you know Cervantes' brilliance is to push things to their absolute limit. It's actually not only is the woman unimpeachable in her own uh, case to begin with, it's the man's need to test the purity of his wife's um, uh, uh, his her her behavior, her uh, honorable standing that actually ends up making her vulnerable and ends up pushing her into exactly the kind of relationship that uh, that leads to her demise, to his demise, and to kind of the, uh, uh, the, the, the bloody end of the story. So really what Cervantes is saying is the problem is the honor code itself. The problem is this set of expectations that would lead someone like Anselmo in this case to really not just accept that his wife loves him, but rather keep on testing her to the point where he's actually pushed her into a situation where uh, she's violated the, uh, the the standard behaviors of the honor code. <coughs> right, and it kind of reminded me of um, Love in the Time of Cholera too, where you see these uh, kind of restrictions on love based on class and status. Um, and uh, and then it, it leads to these kind of knock on effects, these very strong side effects, uh, especially in the form of the main character uh, where he can't he has this unrequited love. And so ends up making love to hundreds of women as a result. Mm -hmm. And the right just uh, but it seems like well, that's a good example of possibly an influence that Cervantes had on um, on people in the in the 20th century. Do you see uh, many other examples of that? Many, many such examples. And of course, you're just mentioning Gabriel García Márquez, one of the great, great uh, uh, novelists of the 20th of uh, the 20th century, recently died several years ago. And his great and uh, in fact, novel that had been turned into a, a film, I think was Javier Bardem as well. Terrific mm -hmm. novel, absolutely beautiful novel. So many more influences as well as, as the great Gabo. Uh, influences on uh, writers in our own uh, uh, Anglophile uh, tradition, uh, uh, in, in in French, Flaubert, one of the great novelists of the 19th century, was uh, was influenced by uh, by Cervantes. But you can even uh, go further and 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 point to moments like uh, towards the end of the 20th century. I think um, uh, I want to say Life magazine did a survey of um, Nobel Prize winners in literature. Uh, to come up with kind of the list of the 100 most important books uh, 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 ever written. More than half of them cited Don Quixote as number one, right? The next author on the list didn't even come close, right? So we're talking about in that particular um, uh, survey of, of, of influence, Cervantes is so far out and ahead of uh, ahead of Shakespeare, ahead of others that that it's it's not even funny. Um, you know the uh, uh, the great Harold Bloom um, once said, who's you know very famous for having written the book on, on the Western Canon, uh, uh, a great Shakespeare scholar himself, did at one point say the literary world is divided between, uh, and I'll just do this in kind of chronological order, uh, Dante, Cervantes, and uh, uh, and Shakespeare, right? There, there is no one else. If you want, you have that pantheon and the others all all follow. And, you know, and, and I think many, those of us who, who study kind of the, the Western tradition and the Western canon would, would agree in terms of their influence, um, Dante on poetry, Shakespeare on theater in particular, although of course he branches out uh, quite extraordinarily into poetry as well, but Cervantes on what we would call extended narrative fiction. Those would be kind of the, the branching areas of influence going out. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And, and uh, I, I, I definitely see him 
in a lot of stories that I read, but also even in film sometimes. You say, oh, there's, there's a hint of Don Quixote Sancho Panza in there as well, where, where you have kind of the person who is, because they're bigger in presence somehow, they, they sound confident, mm -hmm. um, maybe even learned, and, and they kind of present a spectacle that you have to deal with. And so their sidekick might actually be more rational, but because they don't have the same kind of personality, then they're kind of forced to contend with right. this, uh, this buffoon, really, who could lead them to the end. And what's so crazy is that Don Quixote doesn't retract any of his ideas until it's the end. Right. Until he doesn't have to be a performative person anymore. And I wonder if there's something universal about that uh, with uh, humanity where we're kind of forced to perform in order to get along. And then once it's the end, then there's no reason to do that anymore. Yeah, that's that's a really insightful reading, and and also this performance, as you point out in the in the question, it's it it's sort of as part of a pair, and that's another of the great innovations, right? Uh, that Cervantes is really, in some ways, it was the great. We could, we have this genre today of road movies or body movies or something like mm -hmm. that, right? Um, and and this is you know one of the first great uh, examples of that. Two oddballs, uh, we've got an odd couple on the road mm -hmm. together. Right, kind of uh, testing each other um, and developing a strong and fast friendship, despite or kind of overcoming their uh, their differences in a way and their difference of seeing the world. You know, one of the great turns and, and beautiful moments at the end of the book is when it's not at the end; it's not just Sancho, but there's the uh, El Bachiller. Uh, uh, Sanson Carrasco is one of the group, and and he's back at the house with uh, Quixote after he's been brought in for the final time, and is kind of uh, uh, denouncing his own belief in the um, in in the world of of of. of of novels of chivalry and saying, I'm not Don Quixote. This was, I was, I had kind of, kind of lost my marbles for a little while. And the mm. two of them are crying their eyes out and they're saying, no, how can you possibly say that? We were all about to sort of throw everything away and go and become shepherds together. And now you're telling us that, uh, uh, that, that we shouldn't do this anymore. And, and you see that his desire to have a better world has infected them in a way. And, uh, uh, and that's, it's a great bittersweet moment at the end of, about a thousand pages of reading. And of course, I'm uh, immediately drawn to Trump too, because even a lot of his followers, they're not really focusing on the details of what he can do. Mm -hmm. It's this spectacle. Uh, he's He speaks as if he knows so much of the differences. I mean, he's not yeah. really referring to anybody. Don Quixote all throughout is referring to actual people. He's referring to knights in the past. He's referring to stories too and places. Right. but but still sounding that confidence and people seem to be drawn to him, even if they don't really you know, care that uh, that he's full of BS a lot of the time. I think you're right. And and so this is, you know, in, in if it's of interest to you to, to go back and look at it, as you, you kindly mentioned the book that I just published much more recently, What Would Cervantes Do? really has Trump as one of its main characters, right? Because for precisely the reasons that you're drawing our attention to right now, one of the points that we make in this book is, is you know, there's in some ways nothing more dangerous than a fictional character who makes us forget that he's fictional. And that's essentially what Trump is always doing, right? He's trying, his his followers have have failed to, because he wants them to fail to, to see that he is in fact a fictional character. What Cervantes is doing is in some ways exactly the opposite, giving us fictional characters who are constantly, because of what they're doing, because of the structure of the fiction that he's writing, reminding us that they're fictional, right? And it's that, that's where the reality, what we call real, reality literacy comes in. He's training us in how to be literate about all of those other potential fictional characters uh, around us, people who want to turn themselves into uh, characters that can um, uh, benefit from the, the, the power of fiction precisely by undermining their own fictionality, by making us, their readers, their audiences, forget that they are in some ways purposely figments of our own imagination. Oh, that's a great way to uh, bring this uh, conversation to a close. I've really enjoyed it. Uh, so uh, and there's all kinds of ways that uh, p listeners can uh, find Dr. Eggington's work online. Uh, work on He's got articles for uh, the, Ar Ar the uh, Chronicle of Higher Education, uh, New York Times as well, and uh, many other places, but also a list of books. The most recent book, um, that's your most recent one that just came out, right? What Would Cervantes Do? What Would Cervantes Do came out this year. Yes, exactly. Okay. And, and then uh, the man who invented fiction about Don Quixote, about Cervantes's life. It's um, it's absolutely fascinating. Uh, 
And of course, people should go out and read at least the first volume of Don Quixote. And I, and I only say that to people because it's a very daunting book, right? Um, but if you want to read both volumes, there it's obviously the second volume, I think is just as good as the first, but, um, yeah. but at least go out and read the first one. And uh, is there anything else you wanted to add? To no, I just to second what you're saying, Chris, and that uh, to, to remind people, yes, yeah, start with the first, because my bet is once you've read the first, you're going to want to jump right into the second. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, the first one is manageable. It's not impossible to get through it if you look at a huge book like that, not knowing that it's two volumes, two different thoughts, too, because they're 10 years apart, right? Right. Oh, oh, last question. Is there a film version that you would recommend? The the the, uh, the question of the filming of Don Quixote was a, is, is a very long and embattled one. So many people have attempted to make this film, uh, uh, and, and many versions have been made. But there's the problem, the inevitable problem of uh, of reducing something of that size and complexity to one um, two hour uh, uh, event. So um, what's I think I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it, but I absolutely loved the documentary version of Terry Gilliam, or documentary story of Terry Gilliam's first attempt to make Don Quixote, which uh. is called Lost in La Mancha. Mm -hmm. That in some ways, ironically, for me, ends up being the closest to the spirit of, of Cervantes' work, even though it's not actually telling the story of the book, but rather the story of yet another failed attempt to, to, make, uh, to make the movie. In the end, he did make a version of it, which I, I, I didn't like as much, which was called The Man Who Shot um, uh, Don Quixote. Uh, that was, and Terry Gilliam, of course, a great director, uh, uh, one of, one of the six members, original members of Monty Python, the only, uh, American member of that, uh, comedy group and the uh, director of so many of their movies. And then ultimately of classics like science fiction, like Brazil. Um, but this is, uh, he it was his obsession for many years was to make that film and the lot, the documentary lost in La Mancha about his failed attempts to make it was, uh, was really insightful. I thought. Oh, that sounds good, because the only thing I can think of is the John Lithgow version, which I thought was just, you know, I, I don't know, doesn't really get to the heart of it. Unfortunately, <laughs> because he's a great actor. But yes, I agree. Yeah. 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 All right. Thanks so much for being with us today, Dr. Eggington, and I look forward to reading your new book, too. Thank you very much. It was really a pleasure to talk to you today. Take care. Thank you. All right. You too. Bye now.